Are you sure that you received the Holy Spirit when you became a Christian? Well, I sure hope you are. I mean, that's what the New Testament says. However, there might be some confusion if you read commentators in the book of Acts. Hey guys, I'm William Dyer. This is Dyer Conversations. Thanks for joining me on another podcast. Today, we're looking at Acts chapter 8. Now, this is an interesting story because things are kind of different than Acts chapter 2. And what I've noticed as I was studying this out again this past year, reading a bunch of commentaries in the book of Acts, as you look at the story of the Samaritans who received the gospel, um, a lot of commentators get themselves into some theological problems um, or leave a lot of questions to you, know, you the reader, me the reader, of, hold on a second, that doesn't make sense, because what I found is that they're trying to read their theology back back into the text. They don't want to take the text, at least, I mean, I'm not trying to read their motives, but it doesn't seem like they want to take the text at face value for what it's saying because they don't like the implications of what it might teach on the role of baptism. But what that does is creates all sorts of other problems for them uh, in, in the theology, especially in their look here in the book of Acts. So a little background, Acts chapter 8, you know, we've moved obviously from Acts 2 to Acts chapter 8. Some different things happen, but this is the next big major conversion story. Uh, Why is it the next major conversion story? So in Acts 1, uh, Jesus had told the apostles, he said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the remotest parts of the earth. And so we see almost like this kind of like, you know, telescoping out or ripple effect out um, plan that Luke is laying out for the book of Acts, that the gospel starts in Jerusalem, then it goes to Judea, then it goes to Samaria, then it goes to the remotest parts of the earth. If you don't know the background, the Samaritans, um, when the Jews went into captivity, some of those who remained in captivity had intermarried with people who were non-Jews, and they kind of became these half-breeds when they moved back closer to the land, a little bit north of Judea. Uh, they, They settled there, now near Mount Gerizim, and they became known as the Samaritans. There was also some major feuds between the Samaritans and the Jews um, in that what's what we call that intertestamental period between Malachi, you know, or the end of the Old Testament, and when Jesus comes on scene. There were some things that can, that happened that Josephus tells us that really built a lot of bad blood between them. So this is a huge groundbreaking moment for the gospel going out, where the apostles are going to take the gospel to this non-Jewish group, you know, and, and now the gospel is breaking forth and the plan of salvation is for more than just the Jews. And this took them some, you know, some getting used to, and, and they had to look back and say, well, the old Testament actually did tell us that this was God's plan. And so they came to terms with it, but this is why we're going and looking at Acts chapter eight. So they give you a couple quotes here as we're, we're priming this story to reemphasize some of the things that we said in the last episode. I'm going to give you a quote here by Robert Stein. Now, Robert Stein, again, as I've said, I'm giving you big-name people uh, who write commentaries that are standard commentaries. He is a senior professor of New Testament interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So a pretty big university for Southern Baptist, and Robert Stein, Southern Baptist theologian, he says this, quote, The desire to refute a mechanistic or mechanistic understanding of baptism that leads to the error of baptismal regeneration need not cause us to divide and separate in time and intent these two components, talking about repentance and baptism, um, of the conversion experience that are intimately associated by Luke and the New Testament. So this is really interesting. What he says is, okay, when we read these verses in in Luke, in, or in um the book of Acts, written by Luke, about baptism. There seems to be, uh, you know, this connection between baptism and the conversion process, not something you do after you become a Christian, but something you do as part of becoming a Christian. He said, but what that does is it stirs up these feelings inside of us of going, hold on a second, that sounds like baptismal regeneration. Now, baptismal regeneration would be the idea that there's something special about the actual physical waters there, so it's not necessarily based on the faith of the person, but you can just do the motion and and you receive it, uh, receive salvation because you went through that sort of um, process. But that's not what I believe. That's not what I think, um, you know, you should believe, obviously. And Robert Stein here is saying as an overreaction to that, not wanting to go that route, 
to to present our views to where people would think that we believed in baptismal regeneration. He goes, that has led to the error where we now divide baptism from the conversion process. And he says that is intimately associated by Luke and the New Testament. So, again, I'm not just speaking here on my own. I'm trying to present to you other major theologians who have come to the same uh, general conclusion. N.T. Wright, popular theologian as well, um, we quoted him last in the last episode. He says this, quote, You need, in other words, to be baptized, to join the company marked out with the signs of the new exodus, coming through the water to leave behind slavery and sin and find the way to freedom and life. And so here, this is N.T. Wright in his smaller commentary on Acts. It's a little two-part series. And he's talking about baptism as kind of like this, this connection, this typological connection between uh, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they left slavery, and then they went through the Red Sea, they passed through the waters, and their enemies were destroyed, and then they you know, were going to the Promised Land. So we too, you know, as people who are leaving the slavery of sin, go through the waters of baptism— um, the enemy sin is destroyed, and then we, you know, follow God through the wilderness to the promised land. Uh, Craig Keener, major New Testament theologian, you should know him. Uh, if not, Google him. He says this about baptism, that it, quote, becomes a normal prerequisite for the gift of the Spirit. So he says it's a normal prerequisite. Now, to be honest, uh, or full disclosure here about Craig Keener, he's not going to make as strong of a connection that that I'm going to, but at least he's saying here that baptism for Luke and the book of Acts is the normal thing you have to do before you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 8. Now we're here in Acts chapter 8. What's the story? The early churches started, and there are some people who kind of started to stand out because of their boldness and their faith and preaching the gospel, and one of those guys was named Philip. You read about Philip earlier in Acts chapter 6. He was one of the people that was set aside by the apostles, and they laid their hands on him and set him aside for a ministry. Well, now he's going out, and he's preaching the gospel to the Samaritans. And so what we see here is in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, it says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. So, again, we see Philip goes down to Samaria, he preaches a message, and that people were now receiving the gospel. Verse 7, For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So not only is he preaching the gospel, and this is really, really important, he's also performing miracles. And we're going to talk about how he got that ability uh, a little bit later. But he's preaching the gospel, he's performing miracles, people are seeing the miracles, they're amazed, and they're receiving the gospel message. Many people were becoming Christians. We read that in verse 6, but also in verse 12 it says, When they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Okay, this is going to be an important point that I need you to keep in the forefront of your minds as we go through this chapter. If you don't follow me on baptism thus far, the last episode and and kind of where I'm I'm prominent in this episode, if you're like, no, listen, baptism is not a part of becoming a Christian. It's after you become a Christian, you know, you get baptized. Yeah, you should do it immediately or, you know, it's an outward sign of inward grace. If you're there, okay, you're still going to accept this point that you're called to be baptized, right? We talked about that in the last episode, but once you're baptized, like, if you believe you become a Christian and then you're baptized, well, then you're a Christian when you're baptized, right? Like, there is no, well, they came to faith, they got baptized, but they're not a Christian yet, right? Like, clearly you're going to say, if you go to your Sunday morning, you know, uh, twice a year baptism service, and you get, you know, 20 people come up and they're going to get baptized, you're going to look at that person and you're going to say, they are a full-fledged Christian, Now, whether you think it happened at that moment or some other time, you know, when they prayed a prayer or God did some event in their life, whatever, the point is, you're going to look at that and go, for all intents and purposes, they're a Christian. Like, yeah, we can't read their heart. We don't judge people's salvation, but 
they've done what the New Testament is said to do to come to faith and to obey Jesus. So we see here that people are receiving the gospel, and they are now Christians. Now we get this introduction of this another interesting character here in Acts chapter 8. Verse 13 says, even Simon himself believed. So Simon was a magician who was there. He was doing, uh, you know, pseudo-miraculous events before Philip ever arrived on the scene. Maybe he was doing real miracles, but they were by the power of uh, the devil or some sort of demon. It says, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed signs and the great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. So here we see again Simon came to faith, believed the gospel, received it, he was baptized, and now he's following along Philip, watching these signs, going, wow, this is a lot better than the things that I could do. So he was, again, a full-fledged Christian. Here's where the story gets interesting, right? And this is where all the commentators start to go all sorts of different directions on, on how to interpret. Verses 14 through 16, it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. So, okay, so they get a reception. The Samaritans are becoming Christians. They receive the word of God. Let's send two apostles down. Why they do that? Verse 15 says, Who came down and prayed for them, so the apostles, Peter and John, came down, prayed for the Samaritans, that they, the Samaritans, might receive the Holy Spirit. Huh. Verse 16, For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is what I want to talk about for this episode. It says that the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon the Samaritans. It is important that we very much pay attention to the language that is used in the New Testament. And one of the things that we're going to touch on in this episode, and, and especially in the next couple is this distinction that Luke makes in the book of Acts between the Holy Spirit coming upon someone or people and the Holy Spirit coming in to dwell in uh, for Christians. So, spoiler alert, I don't believe that this is an instant of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in the Samaritans. That is, when I say coming to dwell in, that is the normal reception of the Holy Spirit, the promise that is given to all Christians that the Holy Spirit will indwell us, I don't think that this is what this passage is saying, that the apostles came down to lay their hands on the Samaritans so that they would receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Why don't I believe that? Well, okay, let's let's go through it. N.T. Wright again, he says about this episode, he says that God is vindicating the acceptance of the Samaritans to the Christian church. Because remember I said that the Samaritans are like this half-breed Jews, the church is all Jewish at this time. So there's going to be this like, oh, can they actually become God's people? Because we're, you know, the, the Israelites are supposed to be God's people. And T. Wright says that this is an episode where God is vindicating to the Christian church, who is fully Jewish, that the Samaritans can be received into the church. Okay, well, I agree with that, in a sense. I agree, and that's the reason, one of the reasons why I think Luke lays this episode out, and then the one with the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the one with Cornelius, to show the gospel breaking forth these ethnic barriers that were there in the first century. Where I disagree with N.T. Wright, and if you read his commentary in this section, is he says the way God is vindicating to the church that the Samaritans can be received in is that God withholds the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit for the Samaritans. So if the normal, let's just say this for the sake of argument, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit comes when a person becomes a Christian. Okay. Well, he said they became Christians, but God did not give the Holy Spirit in this specific instance because God wanted the apostles to come down to then lay their hands on them as a symbolic um, vindication that the Samaritans are full-fledged Christians, and then God gave the Holy Spirit to them at that point. Ben Witherington, another guy that we've been quoting a bunch, um, says that there is no consistent pattern of the reception of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So when you ask yourself, hey, how did somebody in the early church receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit? Ben Witherington says, 
well, there's no consistent pattern in the book of Acts. We just, we just see it coming, you know, sometimes before they became Christians, when they became Christians, after they became Christians, in this way and that way, you know, it came upon them miraculously when they were baptized, when they came to faith, when the apostles laid their hands on them. There's just no consistent pattern. I, I find that incredibly problem, you know, just a, a, big, a big problem. Like, I don't know how you can believe that and then tell somebody that you can have assurance that you have the Holy Spirit if it's that inconsistent. In fact, Witherington goes on to imply that these Samaritans were only partial Christians, and that's my word, partial Christians, but he says this, quote, they, talking about the Samaritans, were simply not fully equipped yet to be full-fledged Christians. What does it mean to be a full-fledged Christian? Like, the New Testament says you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. Like, yeah, you could be a mature Christian. You could be an immature Christian. You can be a seasoned one or a brand new one. You know, the Bible talks about being a babe in Christ or being, you know, more mature in Christ. But you either are or not a Christian. You're not a half Christian, a partial Christian, a three-quarter Christian. You know, that's just not what the Bible presents. And so in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, the Bible says this, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves through Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free man, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. So here Paul says in Galatians, like it's very clear. If you are a Christian, there is equal value to you. Everybody's on the same field. You're a slave, you know, you're, you're a free man, you're a Jew, you're a Greek, male or female. It doesn't matter. We are all Christians. But Witherington, and even Wright, in a sense here, N.T. Wright, are going to have us believe that these Samaritans were not fully Christians yet. They, you know, the Jews in Acts chapter 2, well, they had the Holy Spirit, but these Samaritans, well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, so they weren't fully yet Christians. I, I again... Do you see where this starts to create a lot of problems in your theology? Because what they're trying to avoid is what I'm coming to the conclusion to, and some of the quotes that I'm giving you, is that the normal, consistent pattern in the New Testament is that a person is called to be baptized when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, and that that is connected very intimately to the reception of the forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are the implications of that for us theologically you know, how do you avoid a works-based salvation? And what about a person who can't be baptized? Like, all those questions come later. We're not answering those questions yet. We're not even attempting to. What we're saying is, let's just look at the text and see what the text says before we start looking at the implications of it and trying to say, well, I don't like those implications, so i got to reject this. Let's just let the text speak. All right, so a few points about the text. I've already stated one. The Samaritans were full fully Christians, before the apostles arrived. Let's look at verse 12 again. So Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says, When they believed Philip, preaching the good news. So that's the word faith, pistuo. They had faith of the content of Philip's preaching. What was the content? The good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. So they had faith in Jesus Christ. They were being baptized, men and women alike. Not only did they have faith, but they were also being baptized. Now, remember how I said that we need to make sure we don't read these texts in isolation from one another, but we need to read them to and remind ourselves of what Luke has already said in the book of Acts. Well, when we looked at chapter 2, so if you haven't seen that episode, go watch it, we said that Peter's response to those who realized Jesus was the Messiah and not a blasphemer was repent and be baptized, okay? So they had belief in Jesus. Now they needed to repent and be baptized. And so here in Acts chapter 8, when we get to the Samaritans, it says they had faith and were being baptized. So they are full-fledged Christians. Um, look at Ephesians 1, chapter, uh, ver- or chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. Paul says in Ephesians, In him, talking about Jesus, you also... After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, Pistuo had faith, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, 
who is a ple- who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Okay. Paul has the same message. After you heard the message of truth, right, which is the gospel of your salvation, and you believed it. So you heard it, you believed it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay. So going back to Acts chapter 8, what do we find? Well, we find that these people heard the message, they were baptized, so then they must have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, right? All right. Point number two, the apostles were praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon the Samaritans, not dwell in the Samaritans. This is what we've been kind of alluding to, but let's flesh it out here. Look at verse 15 through 16. When it talks about the apostles, it says they had come down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Talking about they wanted the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, the Samaritans. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so the apostles were praying for the Holy Spirit to, here's the words, right? Like it's important to pay attention to the actual words used. He were praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon the Samaritans. Well, this is interesting because, again, we can't read things in isolation. So if you're at Acts chapter 8, you should have already read Acts Acts chapters 1 through 7. On Acts chapter 6, here's what we find. Acts chapter 6, verses 6 and verse 8. When this group of men who were going to be set aside for a special, uh, special task, and Philip was one of these men, it says that these were brought before the apostles. And after praying, notice the similarities here to Acts chapter 8, the apostles come and they pray for these men. They, talking about the apostles, laid their hands on them, that is these group of men that were going to be set aside, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So what do we see here in Acts chapter 6? Why am I bringing this up? We see a group of men who had already been full of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Acts chapter 6, right? They're doing good work, so they're going to be set aside for a specific task. These men were brought before the apostles. The apostles prayed for them. The apostles laid their hands on them. After this happens, literally two verses later, in Acts, verse, or Acts chapter 6, verse 8, Stephen is said to be able to do great wonders and signs among the people. Then, that's Acts 6, two chapters later in Acts 8, when Philip pops back on the scene, He's in Samaria Samaria doing what? Great miracles and signs and wonders. Where did Philip and where did Stephen get the ability to do miracles? This is a little bit of an inference, but I think that it's, it's a very good connection to make, is that when the apostles laid their hands on these men, they gave them the ability to do miracles. What does that mean for Acts chapter 8? You see the same pattern. The apostles come down to the Samaritans who were full-fledged Christians, who had been sealed with the Holy Spirit, who had heard the gospel, who had believed it, who had been baptized, which means they received the benefits in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the reception of the forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Ephesians 1, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Like they had received all that. The apostles come down, pray for them that the Holy Spirit might come upon them. Come upon them to do what? To do the miraculous signs. We say, why do the Samaritans need to do the miraculous signs? Well, read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, these abilities to prophesy and to do miracles and to interpret tongues and speak in tongues, these were all the gifts that were given to the early church before they had the full-fledged New Testament that we have now to help build up the church with the Word of God, you know, before the New Testament canon came along. That's a whole separate topic, but... That's, that's my point that I'm making here. That's what I think is, is actually happening. All right, point number three about what we learned from Acts chapter 8. The coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Samaritans, we learn, this is, this is not an argument. Nobody's going to argue with this because this is what the text says. The coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Samaritans came from the laying on the apostles' hands. Why did I say that? Because it doesn't come from the faith of Samaritans. Acts chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. It says, he had not yet, talking about the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Then they began, talking about the apostles, laying their hands on them, the Samaritans, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So how did the Samaritans get th- this aspect of the Holy Spirit? They got it from the laying on the apostles' hands, not from their own faith. What does the rest of the New Testament tell us about how somebody receives the gift of the Holy Spirit? The rest of the New Testament tells us that you get the Holy Spirit through the means of your own faith in the redemptive work of Christ, not through this religious means of the apostles laying their hands on people. So this is why I think that N.T. Wright and Ben Witherington and some of these other guys who take this track, take this route, and say, well, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit was going to be given to the Samaritans through the laying on the apostles' hands, not through the normative means of hearing the gospel and coming to faith. I think that creates all sorts of theological problems. Like, number one, how do we know that's the only time God's going to do that? Like, how do we know today God is not withholding the gift of the Holy Spirit from some, you know, tribe that a missionary is going to to preach the gospel until the missionary lays his hands on those people? Show me in the text where we can have a definite conclusion that that's not the way God's going to do it now. How do we know the Holy Spirit's not going to come in some other different way? This is why I think it's important that you do actually see Luke's normative pattern. This is the quotes that I gave you earlier in the beginning of this episode. Luke does give us a normative pattern of how the Holy Spirit comes. So it creates problems when you go off into these other routes, like whether intend and right. All right, the fourth point is this. The coming of the Holy Spirit was manifested visually. How do I know that? Because Simon, the Bible says that Simon saw it. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 18. It says, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now, I want you to I want you to stop and I want you to think about this for a second. When you became a Christian or when you've seen maybe somebody give their life to Christ, whether you think that's, you know, when they're going to the waters of baptism or when they're falling on their knees at the altar call or when, whatever, when, whenever you think that moment happened, did you see the Holy Spirit descend upon them? Like was it a Jordan River thing with Jesus being baptized or the, you know, you got the dove coming down like is that what you saw? No, no, no. You didn't see anything. No, I, I don't know of Christians who claim that. We don't claim that. We think that we receive this stuff through faith, not by sight. And so the question we have to ask ourselves then is, what did Simon see? And some will go, oh, uh, he saw the, the manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Well, I don't think that can be the case. Because... He saw it immediately, and they just had received this aspect of the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So clearly it wasn't some sort of, you know, fruit that it displayed in their life. He saw something physically change or happen to them to let him know that the laying on of the apostles' hands conferred something miraculous to them. Well, we also know that Simon didn't want to help spread the gospel— Right? This wasn't what he was saying. He wasn't saying, hey, you know, you apostles laid your hands on these guys and they received the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. I also want to help people receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me be able to do that. That wasn't his intention. How do I know that? Because he was rebuked by Peter. Peter says, like, hey, you know, you can't buy this sort of thing with money. This isn't what this is about. And I mean, if you think about Simon's background, he's a magician who had these Samaritans captivated that he was someone special. Philip comes down and starts doing miracles that are better than his, and people are converting to the gospel and to Jesus Christ, which means his you know whole magic ministry is falling off to the wayside. So then he you know becomes a Christian, whether he actually did or did not. I think that's debatable, right? Doesn't really matter, but the point is, is that he's at least acting like he's you know accepting the gospel. Well, now what does he want? He wants to pay the apostles so he can have the ability to do what they're doing. That is, sit in a position of power to where he can go around and lay his hands on people and say, now you can do this miracle gift, you can do this miracle gift, you can do this miracle gift. So that way he has his, you know, um, position of authority again that he used to have before Philip came down. So what, it, what am I trying to uh, conclude here 
with Acts chapter 8, right? We've kind of said, I don't think this position, or I think maybe this. Here's kind of, if if you want to go back to N.T. Wright's comment, that God was vindicating the Samaritans. I, I told you, I agree with that, right? I think he is in a sense. But the way God is doing that is not by withholding the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit from them. The way God is vindicating to the Christian church that the Samaritans can be accepted in as full-fledged Christians is that they went through the same exact process as those in Acts chapter 2, right? They had the gospel preached to them. They believed the gospel message about Jesus Christ and received it. And then they were baptized, just like the people in Acts chapter 2 were, which means we can infer rightly if the promise in Acts 2 was that they received the forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit, then here in Acts chapter 8, when they did that, they received forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit. So then the apostles are called down to lay their hands on them to show that the apostles, the leaders of the church, are now you know actually saying, yeah, we, we accept what God is doing here. We are laying our hands on them to symbolically say, that the gospel message has been received by the Samaritans, but that conferred to them the ability to do these miraculous signs, which again was the thing that happened in Acts chapter 6. Another pattern that we see in the book of Acts. The apostles lay their hands on people. Those people are able to do miraculous gifts. We're going to see that in Acts chapter 19 if you uh, continue to stick and watching these episodes. So again, you may disagree with everything I've said here. That's totally fine. Leave me some comments below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you disagree with, why you disagree with me. Um, Maybe if you learned something, that's cool too. But until next time, continue to seek the truth.